Today I'm in Pendleton, South Carolina, a small town of about 3,000 people that is located just a few miles from Clemson University. The town's historic district was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1970. And one of the contributing buildings is the St. Paul's Episcopal Church. The White Clapboard Church was built in 1822. It features a huge pipe organ that dates back to 1848. Located on the streets adjacent to the church are two South Carolina historical markers that call our attention to a couple of notable people who are resting in the church cemetery. Located just inside the cemetery gates, along the brick sidewalk, is the grave of General Bernard B. General B. was born on February 8, 1824, in Charleston, South Carolina, and he received an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point, where he graduated 33rd in a class of 41 on July 1, 1845. At the start of the Civil War, General B. was given command of the 3rd Brigade of the Army of the Shenandoah under the command of General Joseph E. Johnston. It was during the First Battle of Bull Run, July 21, 1861, that General B.'s troops and some of the Virginia troops under the command of General Thomas J. Jackson was in a fierce skirmish with some of the Union troops. In an effort to rally his troops, General B. called out, Rally round the Virginians, boys. There stands Jackson like a stone wall. The name stuck, and for the rest of the war, General Thomas Jonathan Jackson was known as Stonewall. A short time later, General B was wounded and was removed from the battlefield. He died the next day, on July the 22nd, 1861. His body was returned to Pendleton, and he was buried here in the church cemetery. Resting next to General B is General Clement Stevens, who was born in Connecticut on August 14, 1821. As a Confederate general, General Stevens designed and constructed the ironclad battery on Morris Island that was used in the bombardment of Fort Sumter at the beginning of the Civil War. General Stevens was with General B at Bull Run and was also wounded, but he recovered and continued his service, seeing action in Vicksburg and in western Tennessee. General Stevens was killed on July 20, 1864 at the Battle of Peachtree Creek in Georgia. From the grave of General B, we follow the brick sidewalk around the cemetery until we come to the grave of Thomas Green Clemson the founder of Clemson University. Thomas Green Clemson was born on July 1, 1807 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And as a young man, he developed an interest in agriculture and spent several years studying abroad. On November 13, 1838, he married Anna Calhoun, who was the daughter of Vice President John C. Calhoun. After the Vice President's death, Anna and the two other Calhoun children inherited the vice president's plantation he called Fort Hill near Pendleton, South Carolina. After a long legal battle, Thomas and Anna moved into Fort Hill in 1872, but just three years later, in 1875, Anna Calhoun Clemson died and left Fort Hill to her husband Thomas, who lived there until his death on April 6, 1888.
In his will, Thomas Clemson called for Fort Hill to be used to establish a land-grant university to be named Clemson Agricultural College of South Carolina. The college was officially chartered in 1889 and was renamed Clemson University in 1964. Today, the Fort Hill Mansion is still located on the campus of the university and is available for tours. Anna Calhoun Clemson was the daughter of John C. Calhoun, who served as the seventh vice president of the United States. And she adored her father and followed him to Washington, where she worked in his office. It was there that she met her future husband, Thomas Green Clemson. After spending years away, Thomas and Anna returned to Fort Hill in 1871. And later that same year, both of their children would die within 17 days of each other. And Anna would die just three years later, September 22nd, 1875, after suffering a heart attack. The cemetery at St. Paul's Episcopal Church is filled with history. Veterans from the Civil War and both of the World Wars rest here along with some of the early citizens who settled this small upstate community. But it's time to move on to my next stop, just up the road in Greenville. It took me about an hour and a half to make the 40 mile trip from Pendleton to Greenville. Rush hour traffic and road construction on Interstate 85 made for some monster delays. And it was stop and go almost the entire trip. But I finally made it and arrived at my next stop, Woodlawn Memorial Park in Greenville, South Carolina. Woodlawn Memorial Park is a very large cemetery located on busy Wade Hampton Boulevard near Bob Jones University in Greenville, South Carolina. And as you can tell, all the grave markers are flat. And even though I had a general idea of where my target grave was located, it still took quite a bit of time, quite a bit of walking to find it. As I walked the cemetery, I was looking for a grave surrounded by baseballs and other baseball-related mementos. But it was still a little more difficult to find than I anticipated. But after searching for about 20 minutes, I finally found the grave of shoeless Joe Jackson. Joseph Jefferson Jackson was born 
July 16, 1887, Pickens County, South Carolina. When Joe was a small boy, his family moved to the Greenville area. Where as a teenager, he began playing baseball for local textile mills. It was while playing for these mill teams that he got his nickname. And according to Joe himself, he had a new pair of cleats that caused blisters on his feet, so he took his shoes off and played just his socks. Someone from the stand yelled, You shoeless son of a gun! And the name stuck. That day forward, he was known as Shoeless Joe. Shoeless Joe played for three major league teams during his 12-year career, a career that came to a sudden end when he and seven other Chicago White Sox players were accused of accepting a playoff to throw the 1919 World Series. During the series, Joe had 12 base hits, a record that would not be broken until 1964, and led both teams with a 375 batting average. Even though a jury acquitted Joe and his teammates, baseball commissioner Kennesaw Mountain Landis banned the players for life. In the years following the ban, Joe and his wife moved to Georgia where they operated a dry cleaning store and Joe played for a number of semi-pro baseball teams. In 1933, Joe and his wife moved back to Greenville where he continued to play and manage some of the semi-pro teams in the area. And he and his wife operated a liquor store. While living in Greenville, Joe's health began to fail. And on December 5, 1951, shoeless Joe Jackson died after suffering a heart attack. This concludes my visit to Pendleton and Greenville, South Carolina. If you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up below. If you want to keep up with my travels, please subscribe. Until next time, as always, thanks for watching.